Well, good morning. It is good to see each of you here this morning. And as well, welcome to those who are connecting with us through the, uh, the streaming of the service. It's good to be with all of you. Let's go ahead and we'll join our voices together. So if you could stand, please. And as we begin our, our worship service this morning, I'd like to uh, just to read um, some Advent thoughts before we sing our first song. And the reading goes like this. It says, The coming of Jesus the Messiah is a visitation of God to our world. Luke chapter 1, verse 68 says, The God of Israel has visited and redeemed. For centuries, the Jewish people had languished under the conviction that God had withdrawn. The spirit of prophecy had ceased. Israel had fallen into the hands of Rome. All the godly in Israel were awaiting the visitation of God. Luke tells us in chapter 2, verse 25, that the devout Simeon was looking for the consolation of Israel. Chapter 2, verse 38, the prayerful prophetess Anna was looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. These were days of great expectation. The long-awaited visitation of God was about to happen. Indeed, he was about to come in a way that no one expected. And as we think of that, uh, that, that spirit of expectation, that those who are looking for the Messiah, the promised one, that's that idea of, of longing for, for the one to come who would save God's people. And we see that in this first song we're going to sing, O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. expectation of anticipation is echoed in the next song that we're going to sing. It's called, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, Born to Set Thy People Free. Free from our fears and sins release us. Let us find our rest in thee. Beautiful words, great truth that we're going to sing. 
So we'll sing this song. There's only two verses to it. So we're actually going to sing verse 1, verse 2, and then go back and sing verse 1 again. And as well, this song is set to many different arrangements. We're going to sing it to the arrangement of Come Thou Fount of Many Blessings. So if you think of that tune, that's what we're going to sing this song to. So I'm sure you'll pick it up quickly. phrase we just sang was joy of every longing heart. And that thought is echoed in Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. And it says this, in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round them, and they were filled with great fear. The angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that shall be for all people. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Let's sing together of that great news of great joy. Let's sing together, joy to the world, the Lord is come.
Continue that theme of joy. We're going to sing Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. We'll sing the first three verses. Father, we thank and praise you that we can come with attitudes of, of joy for the good news that was announced through the angels to the shepherds. We thank you for this good news of great joy that shall be for all people. We thank you that uh, your promise way back to Abraham that through him all nations of the earth would be blessed. We thank you that the fulfillment of that was through the Lord Jesus Christ, that he came, um, that he came first uh, to the nation of Israel, but as well spread uh, the good news throughout all of the world. And Father, as the saints of old longed for your first coming, your first advent, I pray that you would put within us uh, a longing for your second coming. And Father, as we feel the weight of, of the, the curse of sin, perhaps we feel it more poignantly than we ever have before, I pray that it would um, it would fix our eyes upon the Lord Jesus Christ and the hope that we have. I pray that we would share that hope in our time that you give us on this earth. And Father, would you give us an eye for heaven, an eye for that time when we will see you face to face, when we will be with you forever, when all wrongs will be made right, when all sin will be banished, when you will sit and rule and reign completely. So Father, we long for that day. We praise the first coming of Christ as well, and what that all means to us. We thank you that although Christ ascended back into heaven, that you gave us your spirit to be with us, to guide us, to comfort us, to challenge us, to convict us. And I pray that as we reflect upon these things, that your spirit would continue to work in our minds and especially in our hearts. Father, we know we're bent towards self, we're bent towards sin, and so we need you to, to right our eyes, to fix our eyes on you. I pray that you would be with us as we hear from your word in just a few moments, uh, that you would teach us and guide us through that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated.
Well, good morning. It's always good to be together and worshiping a, a God that first loved us. And because of that, we, have, we love Him back, right? And we love Him back with our voices when we sing. We love Him back when we listen to His Word and say, God, I just want to learn from You because I want to be like Your Son, Jesus. It's ways we worship. And it is a, an incredible thing. And God has instituted this thing called the church, which in its very definition means the gathering, right? Because people need people. Throughout this whole pandemic from the very beginning of it, as we were, the elders and I were trying to decide, determine, discern, what are we going to do? According to the scriptures, what is our obligation? What, what is our responsibilities? And we, we had four commands that we were using as guidelines for how to navigate this. Because at the heart of it, at the very core of what we wanted was to honor God, right? We just want to be faithful to what we know the scriptures teach and those four commands were, we knew we had a command to gather. Hebrews 10 tells us that. Do not forsake the assembling of yourself together. Um, and matter of fact, he goes on to say, let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. And so we know we have this biblical command to gather. It's part of what the ethos of a church actually is. And we also know that we have this command to Submit to governing authorities. A command that we're going to be talking about today because we are in Romans 13. And we also have another command that guided us, and that was the command to love one another. What does that look like in a time like this? And we also had the command to be wise in the way that we walk towards outsiders. And you can imagine, as you try to pull all four of those together, oh, what do we do, you know? And so the, the decisions that we have made throughout this whole thing have been guided by those four um, principles and, and, and trying to keep those in a healthy, I say healthy tension, it's more of trying to keep those in a way that we're not violating any of them. And, uh, and, and so... This particular um, command that we're going to be talking about today um, is Romans 13, 1 through 7, and it's this idea of submission to authorities. And perhaps there is no greater time in our lifetime to hear from God's Word as to what our responsibility is as believers to live under the authority of our government. I mean, is that really God's desire? And if so, does he really intend this with a secular government? And if that is really his intent, are there any exceptions? Is submission to governing authorities really that big of a deal to God? And if it is a big deal, then what is the reason behind it? I would say in normal times, we just don't give much thought to these questions. We generally do what we want to as long as it's not harming anybody. Uh, we're used to a free society, right? But we live in a season where the government has stepped in and tried to manage a pandemic. And in doing so, um, they have issued orders and restrictions that go further than simple guidelines. And so the question for us is, how does a follower of Jesus respond in such times? Does the Word of God, does the Bible give us clear answers to such questions? So as I open up the Word this morning, my desire is that we would see for ourselves what God teaches relative to these matters and that you would walk away from this teaching with a clear understanding and maybe even a more courageous desire to conform to God's will. 
So this morning I'll be teaching from Romans 13, 1 through 7. Let me read that passage. And I'm going to frame this by asking three questions. The first question I'm going to ask is, what does God say about submission to authority? The second question I'm going to ask is, is there any cases in which submission to authority is permitted? And then really the third question is going to be, what shall we conclude based on what we know from the scriptures? I'm going to be diving into a lot of different passages, um, so uh, buckle up. Romans 13, 1 through 7 says this. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a tear to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed them taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Father, as we dive into this passage right here, God, would you, by your Spirit, help us to see truth and internalize what is true. God, we don't have the authority to make up truth. We only can be in submission to your authority as you have laid it out in your word. So God, help us to see what you are teaching us. In Jesus' name, amen. First question, what does the, uh, God say about submission to authority? Uh, in this passage, it lays out a very clear command. Um, this is an imperative in the original language. The clear command in this passage is for believers to submit to governing authorities. Um, it, we're not talking about religious authorities. We're talking about governing authorities in this passage, which is why as you read through it, it talks about even paying taxes and, and, and that sort of thing because this is, this is what Paul is talking about. And in all reality, what church is he writing to? Rome, right? And so no doubt he's... I mean, he's talking about this Roman Empire that would even include the emperor who was just at best, um, at best, had a hatred for the church. But yet, Paul says, let every person be subject to governing authorities. Why? Why? God, why would we, why would you do that? Why, why do we, why do your people who are under your authority have to be subject to governing authorities? Is there a reason behind that? Paul lays it out. Two reasons behind the command to submit to governing authorities. First is that governing authorities are actually God's design. They're actually God's design. As you read the passage, it says, let every person be subject to governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. He is the author and designer of not just governing authorities, but authority in general. This is why even when we talk, to, um, when we talk about a, a relationship between a child and parents, there's a submission there. Why? Because that's God-designed. 
And God designed government authority as well. And Paul makes this clear. There is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. He goes on in verse 4 and he says, For he is God's servant for your good. Now this is interesting, isn't it? Because he's talking about secular, non-Christian people that don't even worship, they don't worship him at all. Matter of fact, in this culture, they'd be more polytheistic. And, uh, and yet, he says, for he, meaning the authority, governing authority, the state, is God's servant for your good. How does that make sense? It's because this is God's design for functioning in a society. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For again, again, he says it again. For he is what? The servant of God. Now even this, look at this next phrase. This next phrase is even in, more interesting to me. He says, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Now we're not, we're not talking, when we talk about God's wrath here, we're not talking about eternal wrath that we're going to have on judgment day. We're talking about when the wrongdoer disobeys authority and the authority comes and, and punishes those that, um, and, uh, that have broken the law and they violated what God wants, they actually become an agent of God's wrath, even if it's temporary. In verse 6, he says, for because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God. <laughs> it is interesting as you, as you, un, and you read through these seven verses and how many, time, how, what, how many times Paul makes this point that secular government um, officials, people, are actually servants of God. Now, whether they follow God or not, they're carrying out His design for authority. So, God, God designed authority for a couple different reasons. One, 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 He designed authority to administer justice. He makes that very clear in this passage. Governing authorities exist to administer justice. And God designed authority to bring order and structure to society. Without that, society would break down. So, so governing, governing authorities, authorities are actually God's, God's design. design. But he also goes further to say that all governing authorities are established by God. Look at verse uh, 1 again. It says that every person be subject to governing authorities. Why? For there's no authority except from God. He's the, he's the designer of it. He's the author of it. And those that exist have been instituted, or other translations, established by God. You mean to tell me that God places governments in place? Yes. And I think that there is no better passage about this particular issue than Daniel chapter 4. In Daniel chapter 4, we have Nebuchadnezzar, who is king of the world at this time. He is the top dog. He is the highest authority, human authority. And he's quite full of himself. Well, God sends him a dream, a couple dreams, actually. And after his second dream in Daniel 4, um, this is what he says. Uh, he's, he's, t he's telling a part of his dream here in, in verse 17. He says, the sentence is by the decree of the watchers, the decision by the word of the holy ones, to the end that the living may know that the Most High, God himself, rules 
the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of men. Well, then Daniel, after hearing Nebuchadnezzar's dream, verse 24, he says, This is the interpretation, O king. It is a decree that the Most High, uh, is, is it a decree uh, of the Most High which has come upon my Lord the King that you shall be driven among men in uh, your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field and you shall be made to eat grass like an ox and you shall be wet with the dew of heaven and seven periods of time shall pass over you till you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. Well, then we have in, the, in that passage, the, the account continues, a voice, this is right after Nebuchadnezzar boasts, he looks out over his kingdom and he says, man, look at this, look at this great kingdom that is built with my hand, so full of himself. A voice from heaven comes. Verse 20, or verse 31 says this. And while the words were still on the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven. O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you, and you shall be driven from among men. Your dwelling place will, shall be with the beasts of the field. And uh, you shall be made to eat grass like an ox. And seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. Daniel 4 establishes this same principle that Paul is talking about. There is no authority that exists even from a king like Nebuchadnezzar that hasn't been given its authority from God. That's sobering. It should be sobering to us. So this idea of submission to authority is not only because it's God's design and it's established by God, but we have to realize that this was not just a Paul thing. Matter of fact, what did Jesus say? Jesus said in Matthew 22, uh, verse 21, he says, and they, and they said, uh, Caesar's, and then he said to them, Therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. So the people were like, hey, should we pay taxes? Is it lawful to pay the Romans? Well, whose inscription's on that coin right there? This is the John Pickens paraphrase, by the way. And, uh, and so Jesus' answer is, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, render unto God what is God's. Peter himself, 1 Peter chapter 2, says this. Again, Peter says, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether it be to the emperor as supreme. Now, I want you to pause for a minute. We are relatively certain that when Peter wrote this book, there was an emperor named Nero who was over Rome. Now, I don't think too many of the emperors were very good guys. All right, you just know your Greco-Roman history, right? Nero was anything but good. And yet, Peter writes this, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. 
live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. I would imagine that as, Peter, as, as Peter's letter was read in the different churches in that time, I would imagine that maybe there's some jaws on the, what? <laughs> Honor the emperor, what? This wasn't just a Paul thing. This is all throughout Scripture. So the implication, then, is that to resist authority is to go against God's design which brings about judgment. Look at verse 2 of Romans 13. Therefore, he says, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. So resisting authority that God has established has spiritual implications. In other words... In our, context, in our context, there is more at stake than simply losing temporary freedoms. This should cause us to pause for a bit and dwell on our response to authorities in our lives, particularly governing authorities, and not because we have some kind of bent politically as believers, that doesn't matter in, in the sense that we are submissive to God's Word. And so we, as believers, should pause and, be a, and, and dwell on our response to authority simply because of what God's Word says. So God's judgment also in this passage you see can come through governing authorities as well. It has implications. And so we need to be very careful, very discerning. And it also brings then up this question. Everybody wants to, is there exceptions to this? I mean, do I just sit there and be a a mat that gets stomped on? Are there any cases in which submission to authority is permitted or justified before God? I'm going to give you two examples. And in giving you these two examples, these are the only two examples I really see in the Scriptures. And so they're the only two examples I can give you. And I think that we need to weigh carefully in our context, do the things that we struggle with fit one of those two exceptions? Here's the first exception. It is permitted in the case when authorities are telling you to do what God has told you not to do. When the government authorities are telling you to do what God has told you not to do. We see this example in, with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the book of Daniel where they were refusing the king's edict to bow down to a statue. In Daniel 3, 10 and 11, here's, here's um, what it says. It says, You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, uh, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery 
furnace. Now, it's funny, my head right now is singing a VeggieTales song. You ever, you ever, <laughs> oh no, what you gonna do? The king, okay, all right. Now I got it in your head. <laughs> Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's response to the king was this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king, said to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you this in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Why was that so important? It was so important because if you read your Old Testament, idolatry is big. Matter of fact, that was Israel's downfall, wasn't it? No sooner than the commands were made than they were worshiping a golden calf. They broke the first four commandments just boom, right off the bat. And as you read the Old Testament, you see this idea of idolatry over and over and over again. Israel was to worship no one but Yahweh. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew this and refused to bow down to the golden image. Even though the law said to do that, they refused and it was justified. The second reason that submission to authorities is permitted would be this. It is permitted in the case when authorities are telling you not to do what God has told you to do. When the authorities are telling you not to do what God has told you to do. I'm going to go back to the book of Daniel. And then I'm going to look at the book of Acts. In Daniel chapter 6, we see Daniel's praying to God through, uh, though the, the, the law restricted anyone from praying to any other God but Darius, who wasn't even a god. And Daniel 6, 7 says this, all of the presidents of the kingdom and prefects and the satraps and the counselors and the governors all agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition to any god or man for 30 days, except to you, O king, shall, shall be, be cast, cast into, into the den of lions. lions. Therefore, Therefore King, king Darius, Darius, verse 9, signed, signed the document and the injunction. What did Daniel do? Verse 10, when Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber, open towards Jerusalem, he got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. So Daniel was like, you're telling me not to talk to the God of the universe, the God for whom and by whom all things exist. Sorry, that's not going to happen. And he immediately read the edict, and what did he do? He went up and he prayed. Because he knew that the government was asking him to do something that God was calling, not to do something that God was calling him to do. And we also see this with the apostles in the book of Acts, chapter 4, when they um, were, when the apostles were before the Sanhedrin, and they were forbidding, Sanhedrin was forbidding uh, the apostles to teach in Jesus' name. Now, 
Granted, the, the Sanhedrin were not Roman authorities. They were the religious authorities in their society and had authority of their own. In verse 18... Acts chapter 4 it says, So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered him, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. In other words, the apostle says, we're going to obey God rather than you in this matter. Because they were asking them not to do what God had clearly commanded them to do. So those are the two exceptions that I see in the scriptures. What shall we conclude from that? First conclusion is this, as believers, we should submit to our government because it's the right thing to do. Now, this is always an interesting thing because obviously there's so many different nuances to this, right? No doubt many of you sitting here and listening will look and see, man, our government has just overreached. And the reality is perhaps they have. And matter of fact, there's been a, Supreme, a Michigan Supreme Court hearing that said that very thing. But we have a system in place to, to bear that out. And so as we as believers are living in this society, regardless if we agree with the law, regardless if we think that there is overreach, we live within a system of laws to let that be carried out. What is our responsibility in, in the meantime is, I believe, clearly from the scriptures, I believe that we are submit to our government because it's the right thing to do. The second thing, conclusion, is that believers need to weigh, we need to weigh very carefully what circumstances we try to justify for resisting government authority, governmental authority because it is not a light matter to God. It is so easy in our highly partisan, politicized society to just draw up teams and I mean it's I'll give you an I'm an Ohio State fan all right some of you I know already as soon as I said that you went you know and you might otherwise like me as a person (laughs) but I have my team and you have your team and so um, when you talk about let's say this Michigan-Ohio uh, State rivalry, that, that game didn't take place yesterday. I was so sad. But uh, uh, here's this rivalry, right? And, 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 and people draw up sides. And let, let me tell you, there's some crazy Michigan people and there's some crazy Buckeyes who take this to the extreme. It's like, come on, people. You know? But part of it is because, hey, this is our team. You know, we're... And, and we, almost, we, we almost put our identity into that, right? I, I think we do the same thing with politics. We put so much of our identity in our political um, standing that, that, that this is, I think this is one of the reasons why our whole society has become, our whole political system has become so partisan. Both sides. Regardless of that, all of that, if we're going to resist authority, we better weigh very carefully. 
whether it's right to do that or not, whether it's justified before God or not. And the only reason I say that, I say that because I love you. I say that because I, 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 I see what Romans 13, 1 through 7 says. It's not a light matter to God, even with a corrupt Roman government. Third conclusion is that unjustified resistance will have devastating effects. Unjustified resistance will have devastating effects in three ways. One, divine judgment. Now, I'm not talking about judgment at the end of the time. You know, I believe that God can exercise His, his wrath, wrath on His people through government, just as Romans 13 says, in temporary ways because of our rebellion. It also can have devastating effects in terms of human punishment, right? We resist and we suffer the consequences. Now, there are times when it is justified, then you better be, you better be sure Give me the consequences. Give me the human punishment. That's fine if it's justified. Let me give you an example. And this is going to be controversial, I know. I don't care. If I were to be asked, or not asked, if I were to be forced and said, you have to perform a marriage ceremony with a same-sex couple. I would say, I cannot do that. Why? Because it violates what I believe the Scriptures teach about the sacred union of marriage. And because of that, if you're going to throw me in jail, then I guess I'm going to have to accept my human punishment because I cannot do that. And there's a variety of other things. If it's justified resistance in human punishment, my co- hey, listen, the apostles did that same, very same thing, right? They told them not to share the gospel. They shared the gospel, and they suffered for it. And they walked away with joy. Pete, you remember Paul in a Philippian jail? What was that cat doing? He was singing. (laughs) They just flogged him. I don't know that I would be singing after I was flogged, but he was singing. And God used him in incredible ways. Even that Philippian jailer came to know Christ. But if it's unjustified, then you're suffering punishment for no good reason. Third way that unjustified resistance will have devastating effects is gospel disillusionment. In other words, if God's people are being rebellious to governing authorities and it's not justified in the scriptures. What are we communicating to an outside world, to outsiders, to non-believers about Christ? We have to be careful. So unjustified resistance will have devastating effects in three different ways. Now, I'm not talking about justified resistance. I'm talking about unjustified resistance. The fourth thing that we'll conclude and I will wrap things up is that submission to authority doesn't mean that you do not have a voice You have a voice. It means that you can exercise your voice 
from a position of submission. This is what it means to honor God in this particular subject is that as we are submissive, we use our voice. And we live in a country that allows us to do that, not just in a voice. And yes, we can protest. But we can protest in a way that our voices are heard and laws aren't broken, right? We can exercise our voice in a position of submission. And I know part of, part of all of this is so convicting to me because, yes, there's always inconsistencies in our life. There, there are things that even you know, when, I, when I look at my own life and I go, <sighs> I'm supposed to have a mask on in this little group of people and I don't want to wear a mask. And there's times I just don't wear a mask. Nobody else is wearing a mask, I tell myself. Yet I know, I know what the, what the law is, Right? And I see those inconsistencies in my own life. I'm just being real and honest. And I struggle with that. struggle with that. Because I don't like masks. <laughs> I don't know anybody that does. But that's not the issue. The issue is Am I being submissive? And in doing so, we live in a culture where that kind of radical submission because you believe God's word will get backlash even from God's people. may be called a sheep. Well, I know somebody that went as a sheep or a lamb to the slaughter. And it doesn't matter what the name calling is. Who cares? I'm not accountable. You're not accountable to anybody else but God. And so I am going to leave Romans 13, 1 through 7, for you to pour over, to weigh, and to discern what is right. That's all I can do. Father, I confess to you my own struggle with this. There are times where I don't want to submit. And yet, Father, I cannot get around what your word says. I cannot twist it. I can't make it say what I know it already says and make it not say what I know it says. So God, I pray that you would help me and help our people to weigh Romans 13, 1 through 7 as we walk through this time, this interesting time, this very difficult time, this challenging time, especially in this area. Father, help us. We need you in Jesus' name. I would um, encourage you, if you're online, there are some slides at the, um, that are going to be just scrolling here in just a, in a minute with some questions on it. I would encourage you to go ahead and uh, um, think through those. If you're here in person, those same questions are in the notes. Um, take it and, and, and go over that tonight with your family or, um, or have a conversation around the lunch table 
um, about some of these things and kind of process uh, all of this. I know it's a very difficult subject matter, but uh, that is where we're at in Romans. We didn't pick and choose that. It's just that's where we're at. And I uh, knew that was coming for sure. But, all right. Well, Lord bless. And uh, my prayer is that all of us would um, just continue to be faithful uh, and thoughtful and uh, pursuing, fixing our eyes on Jesus during this time. So God bless.